In 2005, Warner Brothers owned TT Games launched a new video game in partnership with the LEGO Group. That game was LEGO Star Wars the Video Game. Since then, LEGO and TT have developed and published 22 different licensed titles spanning a variety of intellectual properties, and will publish their 23rd with LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga in 2020. Over the years, TT has honed and refined the gameplay formula first established in LEGO Star Wars, and seldom have its LEGO titles strayed far from that formula. And while that formula does make for really fun games, TT's LEGO titles are basically to third-person adventure games with the Call of Duty franchises to the FPS genre. That is to say, cookie cutter. But there was a pre-Traveler's Tales period where LEGO's video game department was a wild west of sorts, with various contracted development studios just kind of throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what would stick. There was absolutely no formula. And we got some seriously phenomenal games because of that. And that's the era of LEGO games this video is all about. Now the first LEGO video game dates back to a decade before LEGO Star Wars. Released on the all but forgotten Sega Pico, LEGO Fun to Build is often overlooked within the greater canon of LEGO titles, in part because of the Pico's relative obscurity outside Japan, but also because it will forever sit in the shadow of its younger and more popular successor, LEGO Island. Arguably the first true LEGO video game, 1997's LEGO Island shook up LEGO games for the better. Developed by Mindscape and published in partnership with LEGO Media, LEGO Island surged in popularity and prompted LEGO to begin cranking out video games at a record pace, and got itself one of the coolest bits of convention memorabilia I've ever seen. And while LEGO Island would definitely fall under the vast umbrella of adventure games, LEGO's follow-up titles were all across the genre spectrum. Joining LEGO Island were a handful of racing games that included 1999's LEGO Racers, 2001's LEGO Racers 2, 2000's LEGO Stunt Rally, and 2002's Drome Racers. 2000's LEGO Land was a theme park management simulator similar to Roller Coaster Tycoon, but set within LEGO's own brand of theme parks. Several building sims were added to the LEGO Interactive catalog with 1998's LEGO Loco and LEGO Creator, and in 2000 with LEGO Creator spin-off LEGO Creator Knight's Kingdom. We even got a 3D puzzle platformer in 2000's LEGO Alpha Team, an RTS-style resource management game in 1999's LEGO Rock Raiders, a soccer sim in 2002's Soccer Mania, and a chess game of all things with 1998's LEGO Chess. And to top it all off, LEGO Island's vast success warranted the creation of two sequels, 2001's LEGO Island 2 Brickster's Revenge and 2002's Island Extreme Stunts. But that is not even the full extent of LEGO's video game catalog. Their Bionicle, Shima, and Ninjago franchises have all received a number of console and handheld game interpretations, and even more recently the LEGO City brand has spawned a number of its own action-adventure games on modern consoles. LEGO Star Wars' massive success meant that these more niche genre games weren't worth the time and effort to develop, so I want to take a moment to talk about a few of the more prominent titles from the era, in part just because I like talking about them and thought this would make a neat subject for a video, but also because I want more people to know about them and maybe try them out for themselves. So firstly, I want to talk about the LEGO Racers games. Arriving on the scene just three short years after Mario Kart 64, LEGO Racers is an arcade racing game in the truest sense of the word. And what it may lack in length, the robust narrative content, it is good, clean fun. For one, you get to design your own car. LEGO Racers 2 added even more in-depth customization features, but the original flavor LEGO Racers did fine all on its own. Now, the idea for LEGO Racers didn't actually come from the LEGO Group, but from eventual LEGO Racers developers' high-voltage software. According to Developer Diaries archived on IGN, High Voltage founder and CEO Kerry Ganofsky came up with the idea for a game where you could build cars out of LEGO bricks and then race with them. This idea was developed for a year or so internally at High Voltage before the team was able to get a formal green light from LEGO Media to properly develop the game. Now the power-up system in LEGO Racers is one of my favorites in any racing game where something like Mario Kart, and unfortunately the second Racers game as well, use more of a mystery box, slot machine style power-up selection system, LEGO Racers lets you decide what power-up you'll use by categorizing the items you can acquire into distinct archetypes. Attack items, defense items, trap items, and boost items each signified by a red, blue, yellow, and green brick, respectively. Collecting the colored brick will give you access to the base item in that power-up family, but then collecting white bricks on top of it will upgrade that item up to three times. This makes LEGO Racers, in my opinion, 
one of the more tactical racing games on the market. Former High Voltage executive producer Keith Morton said the team had several important goals in mind when making this phenomenal power-up system. This system had to hit four benchmarks. Uniqueness, use of LEGO elements as much as possible, use of LEGO construction values, and be fun and rewarding to use. And I think you'll agree that these goals got the team exactly where they needed to be. And with a killer soundtrack from High Voltage's Chief Creative Officer Eric Knopfsinger, LEGO Racers is a classic that any fan of the racing genre, or LEGO in general, should do their best to play before they die. Now secondly, I want to talk about LEGO Rock Raiders, LEGO's much beloved resource management sim. Or, more correctly, the PC version of LEGO Rock Raiders, their much beloved resource management sim. I need to add this caveat in here because Rock Raiders actually exists in several different versions based on what platform you're using. The PC version of Rock Raiders is arguably the classic version and the most widely played and known, but a PlayStation version of the game was also released, and is not a real-time strategy game at all, but a more simplified action game, where instead of controlling squads of miners and vehicles from a top-down perspective, you control a single character exploring and collecting energy crystals. The game is still top-down, but the gameplay and missions are totally different from the PC version of the game. Former LEGO Media producer David Upchurch, in an interview with Maximum Power Up, said that the genre change from RTS to action was due to the poor critical reception of PlayStation ports of the Command & Conquer series. The change was demanded from on high a mere six months before Rock Raiders was intended to go gold, with executives within LEGO Media claiming, RTS games don't work on PlayStation. And this kind of interference was apparently not uncommon during the development of new LEGO titles. Simon Goodwin, a programmer at LEGO Racers 2 and Drone Racers developer Attention to Detail, put it this way. The management department of LEGO games seldom lasted as long as it took to complete a console title, and drew from a pool of people with little experience in the games industry, which meant frustrating changes in direction that did not improve the eventual product. So frantically, the team in charge of the PlayStation edition of Rock Raiders needed to figure out what to do now that their game's entire format was getting thrown out the window. After investigating with the team what could be done in the game's 3D engine, Upchurch suggested PS1 development pivot to something in the vein of Rare's Blast Core. Instead of traditional RTS gameplay where the player would control squads of workers and vehicles, a Blast Core style game would allow the players to control one character at a time and manually pilot each of Rock Raiders' impressive fleet of vehicles. But even with this new inspiration, Upchurch was pessimistic about the future of Rock Raiders' release on PlayStation. The worst thing was, you'd go back to your hotel, as I completely knackered, and uh, you'd lie there in bed, you'd go, oh, we've had a good day, we've made a lot of progress today. And then your sort of final thought would always be, yeah, but it's still going to be shit though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And on top of this change from RTS to action, the PAL and NTSC version are also completely different in terms of content. The missions on each version are completely different from one another, and the PAL port even has an extra three missions not available on the NTSC version. According to Upchurch, in an email exchange with forum moderators on RockRaidersUnited.com, apparently this was due to interference from Sony's varied international entities. According to Upchurch, once Rock Raiders was ready to release on PlayStation some nine months after the PC version, Sony Computer Entertainment America approved the game for release. But Sony Computer Entertainment Europe didn't think the game was quite ready to hit the market, and mandated a few extra months of attention on the PAL version of the game, which meant that the European version of Rock Raiders on PlayStation ended up being quite different from the version we got here in the Americas. When all was said and done, the development of Rock Raiders was such that David actually called it the project that killed me. And though all three versions of the game received mixed reviews from critics, Rock Raiders has found a passionate fan following in recent years, with some dedicated fans even working on HD remakes of the game in their spare time. Now, during my childhood, there was rarely a time when my computer was powered on and Rock Raiders wasn't booted up. It would be another few years before I had a chance to play any of the more widespread and popular RTS games on the market, so Rock Raiders ended up being my StarCraft. And if you can get your hands on the PC version of the game, you should. However, 20 years later, there is still one level late in the game that I've never been able to beat. Hopefully 2020 will be the year I finally beat Rock Raiders. Now lastly, I want to talk about Island Extreme Stunts, the last game in the LEGO Island trilogy. Extreme Stunts was the final game from UK-based LEGO Island 2 developer Silicon Dream Studio. And as the dropping of the LEGO Island branding would imply, Extreme Stunts, while technically in the same canon as LEGO Island, is not a direct sequel to LEGO Island 2. 
The game is essentially a 3D platformer interspersed with a variety of minigames ranging from racing to skydiving to skateboarding contests. You play a slightly more mature version of LEGO Island's main protagonist, Pepperoni, now graduated from pizza delivery to become a full-time stunt performer at the island's newest movie studio. But this was not the original plan for a third LEGO Island game. Over the years, LEGO hired a number of different studios to develop games for the LEGO group's various properties, and they'd often coordinate with their contracted studios to make sure upcoming LEGO games synced up with the release of new physical product lines and themes. Such was the case for the third LEGO Island. Silicon Dreams associate producer Dean Roscoe recalls that the LEGO group had been discussing a product line based on the Silk Road. Roscoe speculated that this would end up being a sub-theme of the Adventurer's theme, and as such began working on a pitch along with other Silicon Dreams devs Andrew Lee and Jonathan Phillips for a LEGO Island game that could fit into the Silk Road and Adventurer's theme. But this version of LEGO Island 3 didn't get far beyond pitch documents, and probably for good reason. The whole idea of LEGO Island kind of necessitates the existence of an island, and doesn't necessarily work on a journey throughout the Near East. However, Roscoe Lee and Phillips pitch sounds like it would have made for an incredible LEGO game, if not a discordant island sequel. Here's how he described the pitch for LEGO Island 3. The design of this game, unlike LEGO Island 2, was to be more like Zelda Ocarina of Time, using a flow of moving across a set of different landscapes with some backtracking, building up a set of key tools which would unlock the ability to access new spaces and perform new abilities, each area culminating in some form of dungeon and boss fight which would test the player's skill using their growing set of abilities, whilst unlocking new abilities for use in future dungeons. But after focus testing of the Silk Road theme didn't garner the interest LEGO hoped for, the offshoot adventurer's theme was changed to one with an extreme sports focus, which Roskell said, fit closer to the existing range of LEGO Island games as Pepper was already a skateboarder, and the island could make for a good basis for a skate park style environment, easily adapting to the physical sets being produced. And so development of Island Extreme stunts continued until the game's release in 2002. I poured hours and hours into Extreme stunts, significantly more than I had for either of its predecessors. Now your completion of the game is tracked by percentage, much like in Rare's Donkey Kong 64, and at one point I'd amassed 104% completion of Island Extreme stunts. Now I don't actually know at what percent the game is totally complete, but maybe it's time to dive back in and see. So obviously, these are just a few of the many, many games from LEGO's early forays into video game development. But we'd be here for hours if I were to go through all of them in detail. So this year, why don't you take some time to find one of the games I mentioned here and try it out for yourself. I'm sure not all of them have aged as well as I'd hope, but maybe you'll get some of the same enjoyment out of them as I did when I was a kid. This is Jake Terrio with Subpixel. If you've made it this far, hopefully it means you enjoyed that video that you just watched. So if you could leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you're not subscribed already, that lets us and our robot overlords at YouTube know that this video is worth watching. So thank you for that, and we'll see you next time.